All right, well, let's talk about the uh, the campaign and where things stand. Uh, an ad was put out, I believe it was today, earlier this morning, I seem to remember seeing it. Um, we saw the importance of social media in the uh, last presidential campaign. How much of an effort is there by the Biden campaign to match fire with fire uh, with what the Republican side is putting out? We're taking nothing for granted in Nevada, and we benefit from the last few years of real investing in the Democratic Party infrastructure, we have thousands of volunteers across the state that are activated and ready to get to work to make sure that Donald Trump is a one-term president. And the idea of matching fire for fire is a little unrealistic considering how poorly the Republicans have done in recent cycles. We know that we can take nothing for granted, but that we have a solid and real infrastructure that we're going to build upon in this cycle. Okay. When I say fire with fire, I mean uh, the the Republican side and the the Trump campaign has, and especially in the last presidential race, was very um, aggressive in its whether it's social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, I guess that's what I mean when I say matching matching that level of engagement uh, from the Democratic point of view. Um, anyway. uh, speaking of uh, former Vice President Biden, um, where is he? <laughs> I don't think he's been here since the, uh, the, uh, the primary, or since the caucus, I should say. Um, are you concerned about the attacks on, on where he's been and the allegations that he is in hiding? So the Vice President has taken medical recommendations really seriously as to the need to social distance, to quarantine, and to follow best medical practices. So he's largely been in his home in Delaware and has taken regional trips, but that doesn't mean that he's stopped working hard. In fact, the vice president has said that he has been working harder now than he, uh, than he did previously because he is glued to his screen and making sure that he's communicating with voters as much as possible. He spent almost the better half of the month of uh, leading up to the caucus here in Nevada and met with lots of voters then and has continued that same commitment, even if it's virtually, by making sure that he's not only doing press interviews to get his message out, but also doing interviews across the country, meeting with voters in socially distanced, safe ways. Uh, I feel like the vice president is active and doing as much as he can to meet with voters while putting their health and his own health into consideration. And, and acknowledging with the coronavirus that changes a lot of things, certainly for, for everybody. Um, but does it put um, a campaign like the Biden campaign on a bit of the back foot when you can't travel as much of the country, when you can't be uh, public, uh, speak publicly in theaters and you know coffee shops, whatever the case may be? Um, does that make the task more challenging? Yeah, the pandemic has changed everything and the campaign is no exception and communicating with voters remains the number one priority for the campaign and so navigating this new world of virtual communication of zoom town halls of using social media in different ways of making sure that we spend as much time as possible on phones when we can't go to um, knock on folks's doors uh, is all part of a very evolving new learning environment for everyone on the campaign, not the least of which is the vice president, but uh, that priority to talk to voters, to let them know about the kind of president Joe Biden will be, remains at the top of our work. And I'm proud of the work we're doing in state to navigate that and really grateful that we have a campaign at the national level that is nimble and flexible and doing everything it can to adapt to this environment. So let's talk about the coronavirus, um, pure and simple. From the Biden campaign's point of view, what is President Trump doing wrong and what would a President Biden do differently? Joe Biden has taken a very public position and he would have treated this very differently. First, he would have never discarded the pandemic as something that will just magically disappear like President Trump did. He wouldn't have allowed for there to be such a decentralized response like President Trump has. Joe Biden would have ensured that from day one, there was leadership coming out of the federal level so that states weren't forced to fight against each other for things like PPE and forced to compete in a global market 
for equipment like ventilators and masks and testing supplies. Uh, what we've seen at every step of the pandemic is an epic failure coming from the federal government. And what Joe Biden would do differently is not only based on his policies, but also on the way he would make sure that Americans felt like there was leadership coming out of Washington, that there was a plan to not only answer the public health crisis, but the ensuing economic crisis and really give folks a sense of leadership. Uh, I know that's not quantifiable, but it would make a tremendous difference at a time when Americans across the country are feeling epic fear and uncertainty. Well, is there a way to sort of elicit something more quantifiable? Um, you know, obviously, uh, Joe Biden isn't president now, but, you know, come January, if he does win the presidency, I don't imagine the coronavirus would be gone by then. So what steps could be taken on day one to try and uh, improve the situation? So last week, the vice president rolled back what's being called the Build Back Better plan. And it's his economic message that's rooted in a real focus on the need for Americans to not only be able to get back to work, but to be able to get back to work in jobs that give them access and sustainability in the middle, middle class. It involves a reinvestment in American manufacturing on everything from PPE to domestic product. It, uh, it is followed by a rollout on plans that really put at the heart of our country's dialogue, things like housing policy, racial justice policy, ensuring that as we're talking about our economy, we're not leaving behind our most vulnerable. And on day one, Joe Biden is ready to get to work because he's been in as close to the presidency as you can get by being vice president. He doesn't need instructions on how to work the office. And I know that on day one, one of his primary focuses is going to be ensuring that our federal response on the continuing pandemic relies on medical professionals and on science. What we've seen at the federal level is a disregard for what medical professionals have told us is a real serious problem. So he has a vision to both bring back our economy and to ensure that we meet this healthcare crisis with science and medical professionals at the forefront. And I'll move on for the, from this in just a second, but when you're talking about what to do day one and the federal response, um, that sounds very expensive, and not to say that fighting the coronavirus is, would be done on the cheap, but we've already seen in Nevada, you know firsthand, you were just at the legislative session, cuts. Would there have to be cuts made in order to pay for this on day one in a Biden presidency? It's hard to say what, will, what that looks like at the federal level and on the state level. What the vice president has said is that he's supportive of the HEROES Act, which is in Congress right now, which would help states benefit from federal relief at the budget, the budgetary level. The relief that's come to states through the CARES Act has largely been intended to deal with the additional costs created by the pandemic, but has left states like our own in budget deficits that have forced real cuts. So I know the vice president is mindful of the additional cost that the pandemic has placed on states and on the need to ensure that we're paying our bills. And thankfully, he has the experience in the Senate and in the vice presidency to be thoughtful of the big picture budgetary issues that the pandemic has placed on our entire country and on our states and municipalities. Um, switching gears a little bit now to um, the issues of, of racial injustice that, and social justice that have been going on nationwide for the last several months. Um, there have been immigration issues at the Supreme Court level that um, have been addressed as well by uh, the justices there. Um, what would a, a Biden presidency, how could a Biden presidency address th these issues that are being addressed in the streets right now and furthermore address the issues of immigration that are kind of being touched on in the courts, but there are, there's a broader issue that's at hand? So I'll answer both separately, but put them under the umbrella um, on just a personal observation I've made about the vice president and a large part of the reason why I'm supporting him and working on the campaign is that Joe Biden starts his policy making in the same way he carries himself, which is from a place of deep empathy and a need to understand where people are coming from. Um, and I don't think that his positions on racial justice and on immigration are anything short of that. 
he has crafted policies with his team that really put at the forefront the need to see and hear the pain that people are experiencing because of systematic racism that has existed since the inception of our country and that permeates our immigration system. And when Joe Biden talks about the need for racial justice reform, when he talks about systemic racism, he speaks to it as part of the beginning of our country's origin. We have always strived to be a better nation, but have never truly overcome the original sin of slavery. And as his platform reflects that, he is seeking a plat he is putting to get putting forth a platform that not only puts at the forefront the need for economic advancement for people of color across the country, the need to address systemic racism and government run programs related to housing and health care, and the need to ensure that as we're talking about major platforms that we put to, to the forefront the needs that are being brought forward by black Americans as, as it relates to changes necessary to address what are generations of systemic racism. And on immigration, the vice president has been very clear. He wants to ensure that there is a pathway to citizenship for people like dreamers, for people who have fought to come to this country who have been in the fabric of making our country better and ensuring that they too have a pathway to provide for their families, that they have an opportunity to see their American dream made real by ensuring they have the legal status to fully participate in our country. Joe Biden has been unapologetically against what has been an abhorrent moment in the Trump administration of putting kids in cages, of putting families in our borders, situations where they're forced to choose between their safety and the lives of their children. Uh, what we have seen from the Trump administration is a systematic disengagement from the issues that people are facing day in and day out as it relates to systemic racism, as it relates to a broken immigration system. And I've no doubt that under a Joe Biden presidency, we will address those issues in a more meaningful way than we have. Um, and something that's happening now, as I'm sure you're aware, is the issue of federal authorities in several cities, it's sort of the, the way these protests, certainly not everywhere, but in, in, in a couple of cities have manifest themselves in uh, violence and some clashes. Uh, would a Biden presidency support putting federal agents in cities to deal with protesters in, these manner, in this manner? Yeah, thus far, we've seen the Biden campaign stand up and say, not only is that unacceptable, it's an unnecessary response to what have been peaceful protests. And we can use our neighbors in Portland as a prime example where there have been protests of moms, protests of veterans who have come to stand up for what is a very, very special moment in our country to speak to the deep racism that permeates all aspects of policy making, but particularly in policing and criminal justice. Um, and I use the word special because not that it is shiny and pretty, but rather it has been created to open a dialogue that we haven't had in such an open way in a long time and is overdue in my opinion. So the Biden campaign has been clear on the need to ensure that that dialogue continues well into his presidency and that we have robust and real conversations about policing and about criminal justice in a way that puts the voices of those most affected uh, in the spotlight. Uh, have you heard who the vice president nominee is going to be? <laughs> no, I've not. I'll find out when everyone else does. Fair enough. Um, final question is just in, I think I know what the answer to this is going to be, but I'll ask. Um, is Nevada flippable for the Republicans? And how do you intend to make sure that uh, it's the Nevada stays uh, blue? We're gonna take nothing for granted. Uh, I like to think that Nevada is solidly blue, but that's my bias. The numbers show that Nevada is competitive. It's a battleground state for a reason, because in 2014, we swung one way, and then in 2016, we swung another. Uh, Hillary Clinton only won the state by about two percentage points. So the margins of error are minimal. 
and it's why we're running a robust campaign to engage voters across the state to ensure that even in this new environment, we are as creative and diligent on everything from voter registration to get out the vote efforts because uh, Nevada is much more of a purple state than it is a blue state. And it's why you're seeing the campaign's early investment in media and in building out a team that I think will be one of the best in the country. I'm out of questions. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, for stopping by and enjoy Carson City. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Take care. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.